we keep referring back to our mutual friend, but one particular phone call I had with Craig is I called Craig. I was probably six months in. And, you know, it's good to have guys you can be vulnerable with, yep. right? And, and I just said, Craig, man, I don't, I mean, I was in tears. I go, I don't know what I'm doing. I have no idea what I'm doing. And I'm like sitting there with my phone ready to type. He, okay, here's the first thing you need to do. Here's, the, here's six steps towards achievement. Here's what you need to do. Here's the first five things you need to do. And Craig said one of the most healing things that anybody has ever said to me. He said, John, neither do I. Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. I'm so glad you joined us. And if you're new here, make sure you subscribe. We drop all of our podcast episodes right here and you'll never miss one. Today, I want to talk to John Chastine about leading what is broken. A lot of you face that, right? You didn't start something, you inherited it. And what do you do if you have to reimagine, relead? That's what we talked to John Chastine about. I think you're going to enjoy this episode. Today's episode is brought to you by the Art of Leadership Academy. If you're watching this on the day it drops, this is your last chance to get into my Art of Leadership Academy at current pricing. The price goes up tomorrow, and I would love for you to check it out. If you are trying to figure out what you didn't learn in seminary, fill in the gaps, try to figure out how to lead, and you want a community to run with you and coaching from me, then the Art of Leadership Academy is for you. Make sure you just click the link. And uh, well, I'd love to welcome you to the Academy today. Also, this is brought to you by Park Hill Architects. So there's a big change going on in architecture right now. People are moving from auditoriums, from the pew to circles, from the crowd to community, and even from seats in the auditorium to seats on the campus as people are really seeking out community. If you are designing a new space or thinking about a renovation, Check out Park Hill. Go to parkhill.com slash faith or just click the link that you see. And now to my conversation with John Chastine. John, it's good to have you on the podcast. Man, I'm honored. I appreciate you so much and what you do in leadership and your your, um, your books have impacted me. Your podcast impacts me. So thanks. I'm honored. Honored to be well, here. Thank you. Nice, nice to have you on the program. We have a mutual friend in Craig Rochelle. And we do. He, was it him who introduced us? Is that it? It was. So. It, yeah, was. it was. We, he introduced us yeah. and then we met at the Global Leadership Summit one year. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is super cool. Well, a lot of us end up in this curious position you found yourself in over and over again in life. Um, <laughs> leading something we didn't start, right? Like that's a super challenge. How has that played out in your story? Finding yourself out. Uh, yeah, and, and take it bigger than that because you've had a few surprises in your leadership journey too. And I think a lot of leaders will identify with that. Yeah, so I think it all, I'll tell a really quick story that kind of unpacks it better is last year I was actually with our mutual friend and we were talking yeah. about doing some um, church planting, church growth stuff. And I said, man, honestly, I don't know how to plant churches. I, I don't. I don't know that that's my thing. And he... And Craig looked at me and he said, well, then if you're going to help pastors, what are you going to, what do you do? What is it that you have done that you can help pastors do? And I don't know if you've ever said something without realizing no filter just comes out. And so yeah. this thing just kind of came out of my gut. And I said, I fix broke stuff. <laughs> and he said, then that's what you need to help pastors do. And so with a little bit of reflection, I realized that every leadership role I've ever had, I was never the one that started it. I was never the one that launched it. I was always the one that came in on the back end that had to try to fix some stuff. So whether it was in sales when I got right out of college, uh, to being a university vice president, to being uh, a pastor, then to being the president of a university, every single time I took over something that somebody else had built. So it was just a, you know, it's like I was 43 years old and I realized for the first time in my life, I, I know what I'm called to do. I'm called to fix broke stuff. Hey, I was 49 when Todd Wilson helped me figure out that the through line in my life is communicator. That's wow. like, oh, I never put all the like radio and print journalism and law wow. and ministry and podcasting. And he's like, yeah, you're a communicator. And I'm like, ah, pattern, you know, right? look for yeah, pattern. pattern recognition. And of course yes. you're blind to it when you see it. But yeah. what I think is really cool about your story and, and what you've been building out over the last year or so since you had that conversation with Craig is... I think that's where, I don't know. Do you have any stats on that? Like how many people end up starting versus fixing something or inheriting something that almost inevitably has some level of brokenness to it? Right? You know, the only stats that I've been able to really dig up, uh, I've, I've looked for that. So I, I've actually asked William Vanderblumen, both of us, we have a mutual friend yeah. there. 
if he knows of any st- statistics there that that would give more more concrete evidence to that, he doesn't know either. But the, some stats I do know, I think it was Pew or one of the Gallup polls or something came out with, on average year to year, there's forty five you know forty five thirty five hundred churches plant we plant thirty five hundred churches or okay. so, and there's around forty five hundred that die. Wow. So it's like we're it's great to plant churches, and I'm for church planting, and I I help plant churches. Our church funds church plants. But how many churches are dying and how many churches just need to be re-led? They need to be restarted, rejuvenated, you know? Yeah, super rough math. You know, if there's 330,000 churches in the United States and 20 to 30% of them are growing, that tells you that there's probably easily a quarter million that are plateaued or dying. And if you think about the generational leadership shift that's happening right now where millennials and increasingly Gen Z will be tapped on the shoulder, most of us are going to be in your situation. So, yeah, what happened like with the sales thing that you were part of? (laughs) You were part of the worst division or something like that? How did did that happen before you got into ministry? Yeah, so I I had no idea what I was going to do out of college. And I just took the first job I could find and it was in sales and I... You know, for lack of a better word, everybody we relate to, I basically worked for Dunder Mifflin. I sold paper, <laughs> you know, and I, I had a big white van and I drove around a couple states. And and so I, I inherited this territory that was dying. It was the worst performing territory in the company. And and I worked there maybe three or four years. And by the time I left, it was one of the top performing ones. And I didn't think anything of it. I was just trying to survive. Right. Um, but what I realized over the years, Carrie, was that I, I really do think that there are a certain type of people who will never be Craig Rochelle, you'll never be Chris Hodges, you'll never be Elon Musk, those that start, build, grow fast. There really are a group of people who are designed by God to restart things. Yeah. You know, you, and even as I look through the Bible, you know, you think about Elisha. Elisha was a, he, he restarted something. He was a re-leader for Elijah. Um, Joshua and Moses, there's all these people in scriptures who who took the mantle of somebody else and tried to take it from here to there. Solomon, you know, all the kings in the Old Testament following David. So it really is a gift set, I believe, that certain people are gifted to do. If we really realize that that is my true calling, it's to take something that's broken and fix it. Well, and odds are that's what's going to happen to you, right? You're going to inherit yes. something. You're not going to start something. So this was yeah. not an intentional path. You didn't, you didn't set out to say, oh. I revitalize churches. I rebuilt. So what I do. <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. But um, I would love to know what, like, when, how did you get into ministry? Was that a call? Did you go from sales into ministry? How did you go from A to B? I was, I was called into ministry kicking and screaming. So I went from <laughs> sales into higher education, got a master's in education, got a doctorate in university administration. Wow. And I was on the, I was on the path Pop, for popular higher ed. course. I was a, <laughs> Kidding. Oh, exactly. Kidding. Everyone's doing. Yeah, everyone's that these doing. Days. Um, and I became a VP at a university in Oklahoma City, and I was doing fundraising. Loved it. Fell in love with higher ed, and said, "I'm going to be a pre- I'm going to be a college president someday." Yeah. So I pursued that, and then the church that I was attending at the time is was Victory Church, yeah. which is the church I now pastor. I was just attending it. I sat on the back row, and I was a greeter and a tithe. And in 2011, the church came to me and they said, hey, would you be interested in being a campus pastor? We're launching a new campus. And I was, I was like, no, I don't, I'm not interested in that. Yeah. Thank you, though. But after a series of conversations and prayer, my wife and I just took a leap of faith. I left a VP at a university job and went to be a campus pastor. And within a couple of years, I fell in love with it. Yeah. I, was, I was like, I missed it. Higher ed isn't what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to be a pastor. What did you love so about I did that it? For what three- made you fall in love with it? People. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so in, in higher ed, I was a VP for advancement, which was fundraising, but really all fundraising is, is friend raising. All uh, you're doing is, all it is, is relationship building. Yeah. And so when they came to me at the church, I said, listen, I, I don't want to go into ministry because I don't want to preach. I have zero desire to preach. And they were like, no, you don't understand ministry. We don't need you to preach. We have a senior pastor. We just need you to lead a team and love people. And I was like, well, I, I know how to do that. So I did that for three years. Um, one of the few things in, in my life I've ever started, we started a campus from scratch and um, had, a, had a great success. That campus grew rapidly. And then in 2014, the lead pastor, the founding pastor of that church, a great man, made one mistake, had a moral failure wow. um, with his wife. Um, and that is a very long story that I'll tell you some other time. But it, I didn't, I, I thought I'd, I was like, well, my life's over. I gave up my career to come be a pastor. And now this church is going to, 
crumble. Implode. Yeah. And they looked at me to be the interim pastor, which was a shock. At this point, Kerry, I'd maybe preached two or three times in my life wow. ever. Um, this was 2014. And then to make a very long story short, by that fall, November 1st, 2014, I was the lead pastor. Wow. And in way over my head, that's when I met Craig. That's when all that kind of started coming together there because he we pastor in the same city. Um, and just to rapidly fast forward through my life, four, uh, four years in from that, it took us two or three years to really get that church out of the hole. I mean, we were bleeding out. Wow. Um, if anybody's ever taken the reins of a church after a moral failure, um, it's like the, the, best, the best illustration I can use, Carrie, is you go to a NASCAR race and there's a massive crash and everyone's there to see the crash. Um, <sighs> but everyone leaves the arena and somebody's still got to clean up the mess. Yeah. So a lot of times everybody sees it and then you're left for years trying to clean up something that happened in a moment. Yeah. So it took us about three years to really climb out of that in attendance and giving. And uh, about 2017, the church was doing well. 2018, um, I had all this background in higher education. I had a doctorate in university administration. And I thought, I thought I'd left that career in my past, yeah. in, the tri- in, the, in the far past. And then I get a call from uh, the King's University um, in South Lake, Texas, which was founded by Jack Hayford in 1997. And they asked me to be the president of the university. And it was a dream. I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Yeah. Uh, and they're in direct partnership with Gateway Church uh, and Robert Morris. And I said, look, I'm honored. I would love to, but I can't leave this church. Yeah. We just got healthy. We just climbed out of the ditch and I can't abandon this church. And they were like, well, we don't want you to. We want you to do both. <laughs> And I thought they were crazy, you know? Um, so I actually went to Craig's house that afternoon and I was sitting there talking to him and I was like, Craig, this is, this is crazy, right? This is impossible. This is, this can't be done. How could I pastor a church in Oklahoma and lead a university in Dallas? And I'll never forget it. Craig looked right at me and he goes, he goes, you know what your problem is, John? I said, what? He said, you've, you've only met the God of or, but you're about to, you're about to meet the God of and. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a Craig thing. So, yeah. Isn't it? Yeah, he like says 100%. these things that just blow your mind yeah. and it takes a, a week to digest it. Uh-huh. And so I did, man. And for five years, I did that um, from 2018 to this, uh, to June of 2023. Wow. Did it for five, five years. It was a blessing. I loved it. And now I'm just back to pastoring. I have one job and my wife is happier with me than she's ever been. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that's a really fast forward version. I'd, I'd yeah. like to go back to when you became the yeah. lead pastor of Victory Church. And you and I have talked about yeah. this before, and we don't need to rehash every yeah. detail. But you would not believe, again, no statistics, but anecdotally, I've talked to so many young pastors, John, who that was their exact situation. It's like they weren't expecting to be in leadership. Senior slash founding pastor has moral failure, often sexual, um, blows the church apart they get tapped on the shoulder. So, I mean, this is an academic. There are probably hundreds of people listening to this podcast who have been in that situation, many more who will be in that situation, sadly. What is the anatomy or the postmortem of inheriting a church after a moral failure? Uh, I think for every person, it's a little bit different. For me, it was kind of a double, double compounding yeah. issue because one, I was in over my head. I had, I had never been a lead pastor, never wanted to be a lead pastor and wasn't used to the rhythm of preaching week in, week out. Yeah, particularly so when you've a, never that was done a, that, a big right? enough. Yeah. Exactly. Um, uh, a whole nother dichotomy was trying to absorb, you know, uh, in our context, we probably had 60 staff or so. So, so not only are you pastoring um, your congregation, you're trying, honestly, it was easier to pastor the congregation than it was to pastor the staff. Wow. The staff are the ones that are reeling. The staff are the ones that are trying to decide, do I want to stay here? Yeah. Um, and then a lot of churches, you have, you have a lot of nepotism, which we did too. So, so now the, the, the lead pastor has gone, but his wife's still there. Wow. The son's still there. His, his nephew's still there. And like so, on staff? So now or? Be, on staff. Oh, wow. Yes, on staff. So there's so Ooh. many dichotomies to, to these, to these uh, really particularly the first six to 12 months, you know. Every, things happen so, so quickly that with one phone call, everything changes, right? But the way those ripple out can take 
six to 12 months. To st- to, you really don't know where you're going to land in the aftermath of a tragedy for at least a year because yeah. you don't know who's with you. You don't know who's shop- shopping for a job. Um, even the people sitting in the pews are thinking, I don't know about this guy. Yeah. Can he do it? Yeah. He's, he looks young. Who is this guy? You were how old? Um, so there's in 2014. I was, um, let's see, I was 34. Yeah. 34. That's youngish. Yeah. You bet. And and it was probably less that I was young and more that I was um, ill equipped. Yeah. I w- all of my degrees were in education. I I had three years of experience as a campus pastor. That's yeah. all. Yeah. That's all. And um, I was just in over my head. And so, you know, what's funny is God surrounded me with some amazing people. And if it wouldn't have been for them, I would have never made it. And I'll tell you, uh, I keep, we keep referring back to our mutual friend, but one particular phone call I had with Craig is I called Craig. I was probably six months in. And, you know, it's good to have guys you can be vulnerable with, yep. right? And, and I just said, Craig, man, I don't, I, mean, I was in tears. I go, I don't know what I'm doing. I have no idea what I'm doing. And I'm like sitting there with my phone ready to type. He, okay, here's the first thing you need to do. Here's, the, here's six steps towards achievement. Here's what you need to do. Here's the first five things you need to do. And Craig said one of the most healing things that anybody has ever said to me. He said, John, neither do I. Oh. He said, the truth of the matter is, none of us know exactly what we're doing. We're all just trying our best to build the church, yeah. to grow the church, and to build God's kingdom. Mm-hmm. And man, truth is, I knew what he, t- he, he knew what to tell me. He could have given me 10. He could have given me five. He could have told me what to do. But man, it was so healing to me that the guy who pastors the largest church in America, one of the greatest leaders in our day, yeah. um, honestly, I think he lied to me. But he said, I don't either. You know what? I I mean, you know, Craig, probably a little bit better than I do because you have proximity and lots of time together. But like, I don't know that that was that much of an exaggeration. Uh, What I, what I tell leaders is we're making this humility is what it was. And we're making this up as we go along. Like, think about that, even in the context of this, you know, I, I believe Life Church is the largest church attended church in the history of America. So show me the, show me the playbook. Who's got the playbook for that? There's true. no playbook. It's true. It's like he's got a few mm-hmm. colleagues who have led similar things, but you're kind of you're kind of relying on God and making it up as as you go along. And I think that's the the secret of leadership. And obviously, are principles and guardrails and you know things you should do and things you shouldn't do. But I don't really know what tomorrow looks like. Yeah, a lot of the things. A lot of the things. You know, I don't want to speak for Craig, no. but I've heard him tell the story, and he's said it publicly before, of one of the first times he decided to show a sermon on video was because his wife was going into labor. Yeah. It, it wasn't this strategic move and we planned this out for months and years. And so you're right. I mean, obviously that takes a little bit of strategy, obviously, and a little bit of, you know, intentionality, but at the end of the day, what's the Lord doing and how are we pivoting and shifting yeah. in a change, ever changing culture? Um, anyways, uh, that was just such a healing thing for me to hear as a young pastor. I had, I had a moment, it was 11 years ago, last fall, I started blogging. I don't know why I don't think about it very often, but it's like, I remember writing the first post where I'm like, okay, I'm going to like really yeah. post three times a week. And then yeah. I kind of had like a retrospect of my life and I had, a, I had no idea where that was going to lead. I didn't think it would lead to a podcast and lead to millions of leaders wow. and lead to, you know, stupid influence and all that stuff. Like I just had no idea. And so, you know, where's the precedent for doing what I do? I don't know. We're making it up, man. But um, God wow. has been great and we're trying to keep it between the rails here. And we're, mm. we, you know, we don't really see ahead. I have other people I admire who are doing similar things, but like, yeah, we don't really know. So back to, you know, like, let's talk about the staff dynamic. So yeah. you've got the pastor is out because of moral indiscretion, but the whole family's on staff. That too, believe it or not, no stats, but I hear that over and over again. Like there's a lot of, a lot of family businesses in church, so to speak, depending on the world you're in, right? Not so much mainline, but if you're in non-denom or charismatic world, that's a real thing. What, how did you handle that? What were the dynamics? You know, I think it was a lot of, um, and I, it's a term, it's a thing that I use a lot in, in, in this term that I've kind of started using. I, uh, I call it a re-leader, yeah. you know? And so sometimes I'll reference to this concept of a re-leader. I really think that when you're a re-leader, you didn't start it, you didn't grow it, you didn't build it. You've come to redo it, restart it, yeah. rebuild it. And so I, I kind of just say re-leader. So I really feel like a re-leader, um, one of the best attributes of a re-leader is patience. Mm. 
Like you have to have this crazy, to me, Carrie, I don't know about you. One of the biggest challenges to me in leadership, um, more than any other challenge, in my opinion, is knowing what to do, but you can't do it yet. Oh, that's so good. the leader. The lead you're you're the leader because you see things no one else sees, right? You see things that are that are six months out, twelve months out. You see the next mountain to take, but you the the biggest challenge is not knowing what to do. A lot of people know what to do. The biggest challenge is knowing when to do it. Ooh, and so. Um, for me, I think one of the greatest attributes of re-leaders is they, they know, they know the patience involved, right? And so you, you think of a, uh, I use the analogy of a cruise ship, you know, if, if you become the new captain of a cruise ship, if you turn the ship too quickly, you're going to throw everybody off the yeah. ship. You're going to injure people. All the plates in the kitchen are going to fall off. Yes, the ship's heading in the wrong direction and we need to, we're going north and we need to be going south. Any any idiot could know that, right? Any any captain worth their salt knows we're going the wrong direction. The best captains know how to turn a cruise ship without anybody on the ship even realizing that you're turning. That's a great um, analogy. And so, so for me, those were challenging times where I knew this wasn't going to work. <laughs> and like anybody that had any any leadership capacity whatsoever could have looked at this and a hundred other, other, other problems and said, okay, we got to fix this. I think the biggest problem most re leaders make is they change things too quickly. Interesting. They whip, they whiplash the organ, they whiplash the organization. Um, and so a lot of those things were very methodical. Some of those staff members were on staff for a year, maybe two years. Um, and I, and I knew that it was going to shake out. And so I just, I knew that they were hurting probably more than I could even imagine. And so I wanted to love them through that process. Um, wow. Do, do, I don't know whether you're familiar with the Enneagram or yeah. whether you pay any attention to that. Am, do you yeah. know your type? I'm an eight, which is oh, bizarre. Oh, you are? Because yes. I'm like, wow, good for you, but I'm an eight. And like, I would just be chomping at the bit, chomping at the bit. And my wing is a three. Oh, which is, yeah. So, I mean, you're, you're the classic textbook then for the guy who would be the bull yeah. in the China Let's shop. Get Let's done get today. it done yesterday, right? <laughs> like, so talk yeah. to me about the restraint that you were able to show in that. Yeah. I think, um, I think it was a lot of, um, painful, uh, I don't know the word I'm searching for the painful process of that, yeah. right. The, the urge to move. And I don't, I'm not saying I always got that right. I think I royally messed that for up sure. a lot. So I'll give you one example is, um, our church was built and grown in, in the early two thousands, like 2004, we were, top five, top hundred fastest growing churches in America. We were exploding. And um, a lot of it was through, remember back in the day when they would have these big Chris, Christmas pageants oh, yeah. and Easter plays. Yeah. And so we'd rent out these big arenas and have these massive plays. And so that was the early days of our church. And so because of that, our church had a dance studio. We literally started a business, a dance studio in our church where we trained the arts. Well, that had died long ago. I mean, that that was gone in our church. The, the, the plays and the pageants were gone long before I got there. So when I took over, we still had a dance studio in our, in yeah. our church. And the aid in me was like, this is stupid. We're bleeding money. The, the studio is not profitable. Ax it, kill it, crush it. So we did, we closed its doors and man, it, it was hell to pay. Like it, it was crazy. It was, it was bad for PR. It was bad. I was the bad guy. John was the bad guy. So I don't want to sit here and pretend like I always got that right. Cause I don't think I did, but, um, had a lot of great mentorship in my life um, in those in those times that I I didn't move without talking to them. I, I mean, there were a lot of times where I would just pick up the phone and say, "What do I do next? <laughs> What's my next move?" So I had great mentors in my life, um, but I don't know. I, I don't want to over spiritualize it, Carrie, but I really do feel like the the God had just put a grace on me yeah. during that season, and I really do. And again. You can very easily over spiritualize anything, but I really do just feel like the Holy Spirit. Was yeah, leading. and I, I do not discount that to oversimplify it. Yeah, you know? I, I don't discount that. So, this is really interesting. So, for those of you listening who don't know the Enneagram, an eight basically means everything needs to be done yesterday, and I'll do it in the most yes. brutal, savage way possible. Right? Like that's <laughs> that's my 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 absolute it's wiring so when I'm hungry, tired, angry. When I'm not healthy, I'm a disaster. And you know, with respect strength and emotional growth, emotional intelligence, redemption, discipleship, all of that stuff. Hopefully you show some emotional intelligence. 
So this is interesting. You killed the dance studio, but you let the personnel issues linger for much longer than your natural judgment might have led you. Probably longer than I needed to, but they're, they're, they weren't toxic. Okay, you so know, I was going to ask, what was the difference they, between one and the other? Because that is a very common question that leaders have. Like, do I just leave everything the same for the first year? How do I know when? Because let's yeah. say you have the blueprint in your head, and then it's like, well, what yep. gets cut today, if anything? What get cuts tomorrow? Right. And then what about next year? Like, how did you figure that out? I would say... Um, to use an analogy, I love analogies. To use an analogy, if you went to the doctor and they said, um, you have cancer, uh, but it's stage one and we, we can't get you in for surgery for three months, yeah. you'd be like, uh, okay, oh, okay, that's probably fine. If the doc- Versus the doctor came to you and said, hey, you have stage four cancer, it's spreading to your lymph nodes and we're not gonna be able to schedule for surgery for another three to four months. You'd be like, oh no, uh-uh, we're doing surgery today. Mm. We're doing surgery tomorrow. I, you're going to get the scalpel out. You're going to cut me. I'm going to bleed a little bit, but I'd rather bleed a little bit today than die of cancer tomorrow. And so a lot of it is, is this gauging off of, is it, is it toxic? Yeah. How, how bad is it? Wise. Right? How, how quickly do I, how quickly do I need to move? Um, you know, I don't want to oversimplify prostate cancer, but like prostate cancer in, in most cases, a very slow yeah. moving cancer. Whereas if you have breast cancer or lung cancer or, or some other type of, so, so what type of cancer does your organization have, right? How, how bad is it? And I think that that helps decide how quickly do we need to move here? Because there are some things that need to be cut out tomorrow. And if you wait a year, it's going to be detrimental to your organization. It's going to be detrimental to you as a leader um, and your credibility. So um, I think there's, there needs to be a lot of wise counsel there. Um, and engaging what is that toxicity level. Right. Wow. A lot of wisdom there. And I think that's a very helpful analogy. Anything else? You mentioned the pain of the staff was worse than the pain of the congregation. Can you say more about that? Yep. Uh, we had a double whammy. Um, one is this had been the founding pastor, right? right? Yeah. So he's the only one they'd ever known. He had pastored them. He had been there when their babies were born, right. all those sort of things. The, du- the double whammy was that I was never meant to be the next lead pastor. There was actually an executive pastor on staff who was the oh, successor. Oh, the heir apparent. Everybody oh, that would have created its own set the of dynamics, John. Everybody wow. knew it, right? So love the guy. We're friends to this day. Um, but what happened was whenever the, the moral failure was announced, the successor stood up in front of the whole church and said, it's okay, I'm here. I'm the interim lead pastor. We're going forward. And every, the whole church just took a big sigh of relief. Okay, we're, we're going to be okay. Well, fast forward about two weeks, um, he came to the elders and said, I don't, I don't want this. Oh, wow. I don't want to do this. Um, we used to have a campus in, in, uh, in the southern part of Oklahoma City, and he had been leading that for about the last year, preaching there on the weekends and things. And so he came to the, elder, to the eldership and just said, hey, I don't, I don't want to be the lead pastor. I want to, I want to take the, the other campus and split it off and make it my own. So we had moral failure, but then we had a simultaneous church split well, right after yeah, that. Yeah, why not? With the, so the, the number one was gone, and then the number two was gone. And all that turned out to be for the good. <laughs> you know, He's got an amazing church now. We're friends. It all turned out great. Uh, but man, in the moment, that was you had two betrayals back-to-back in the staff's eyes. Our number one is gone. Our number two is gone. Who's this third guy, John, and can he do it? Right? So— it was, there was a lot of wounds. There was just, there were wounded warriors everywhere. And how do you go to battle when your entire infantry is wounded? Wow. So um, that was probably the harder part, Carrie, is trying to figure out how to get momentum for our organization and move that organization forward when most of our troops were laying in the ditch wounded. Wow. Um, so how did you pastor them? What did you do? Those were tough times. Um, our all staffs were very, uh, honest and open and vulnerable. We had a lot of prayer time in our staff meetings. That was the time where we knew we were all going to be together. I would let people share their heart. I would let people vent. Mm. I, I, I said, we cannot pin this up, guys. We have to get it out. We're, we got to move past this. We need to heal from this. And so there was a lot of tears in our staff meetings, and we were very vulnerable with one another about how this, how hard this is and how difficult this is. And I really think because we let people bleed in public, 
um, we didn't we didn't tell everybody to just suck it up and get back to work. It was a it was a very um, emotional time, but we let those emotions be be shared. You know, so that's that's one big thing I would say we did. Um, and time again, it goes back to that patience thing. I I just had so so another good friend of mine that helped me through this. Carrie was Brady oh, yeah. Boyd. So so Brady Boyd became this guy. Craig was great. You know, these other pastors, Jimmy Evans was in my life, a lot of great kingdom warriors. And that was great. Craig could give me leadership advice and um, finance advi- advice, and Jimmy Evans could give me spiritual advice. But neither one of them guys had walked a mile in my shoes. But if I called Brady Boyd, I called Brady Boyd when I was in a fetal position. Brady, Brady <laughs> uh, inherited New Life Church in Colorado oh. after the Ted Haggard scandal. Yeah. I mean, my situation times a yeah. thousand. Yeah. And so his, I, re, I can still hear his voice ringing in my ear. He would tell me over and over again, every time you take that stage, you honor your predecessor. I don't care if you had a moral failure, you honor him. You honor, 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 honor. Honor is key. Honor is everything. Um, and then I remember I called him one time and I said, I said, Brady, man, how long is this going to take me? This was probably yeah. a year in. I go, how long is it going to take me to change the culture of this church? And he goes, well, I don't have good news for you, John. He said, it, he said, it took me five years to change the culture of, of uh, new life. And I was just like, I remember going, no. <laughs> and he said, I think you can do it quicker, John. He said, I was an outsider coming in. No one knew who I was. You're an insider. You were a campus pastor for three years. So you're a familiar face. And he was dead right. It took about three to four years to really, to really rebound and change the culture and survive that. So I just had that ingrained in my mind at a very early stages of this is going to be a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah. And I think that's so key to anybody who's taken mm-hmm. over. And this isn't just church, man. This is this is yeah. the business world. You're a CEO, CFO, vice president, teacher, whatever you are. Um, you're coming into an area where there is already a culture set. You didn't set these values. You didn't build the building. You didn't set the core values. You didn't establish the, the policies and the procedures. You didn't anything. And you're coming in as this outsider, and uh, you are Nehemiah coming to rebuild what was broken. It was torn down. You didn't tear it down, but somebody's got to fix it. Somebody's got to come in here and put this thing back together. Um, and it's it just takes time. It just takes time, you know. And nobody wants to hear that, especially in yes. <laughs> so honor your predecessor. So that's a tension, right? Yeah. And we talked about this on this podcast yeah. before. I think the problem with moral failure is the binary options of the person is banished to the desert, never to be rehabilitated, et cetera, and never to be seen right. or spoken right. of. The other option is that nothing ever happened and you deny the problems. How do you honor your predecessor without justifying the abuse or you know, ignoring yeah, the victims, good. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, uh, I think th- it's a frame of mind, right? So what I try to tell myself over and over again is, um, one mistake or even five mistakes or four mistakes doesn't negate 20 years of a flourishing ministry. Yeah. Um, and so what I want to try to do is spotlight and highlight the beauty of this church. So, so, uh, my predecessor's wife still attends the church. She's, they end up getting a divorce. She attends the church and they sit on the front row wow. all the time. She sits on the front row. And I'll sit there and I say, aren't you thankful for, I'll just say their names, Mark and Jennifer Crow. They're amazing. Yeah. Mark Crow is an amazing leader, amazing man. He made a mistake, right? And so um, even in the midst of the mistake, uh, I think I've heard Craig quote this. I've heard a lot of people quote this. I don't know whose quote it is. Um, you, you may know, Carrie, but... Uh, they say uh, honor is given, respect is earned. Yeah. I don't know where that comes so from either, but I yeah, it's out there. Yeah. I don't have to respect someone mm. to honor them. Mm-hmm. I just don't have to. And so I just think, one, it's taking the high road. Yeah. What good does it do for me to get up and, and push off? So I'm I'm six seven, Carrie. I played basketball in high school and college. Yeah. And so I was a big man down low. And one of my biggest pet peeves was when a little bitty five eight guy would come down into the lane and, and somebody shoots the ball and the ball's coming off the rim and the little guy would put his arm on my shoulder and pull up on me and then push off of me to go up and get the yeah. rebound, right? He's using my height to go find achievement. Yeah. 
to me, that's, to me, that's pushing off. So if, if, if I'm an insecure leader, I'm looking for things I can push off of. I'm coming in and I'm going to, I'll push other people down to lift myself up. And so to me, I don't want to be that kind of leader. Yeah. And so what harm is it in honoring someone? We can find something to honor anyone for. Um, the challenge for me, Carrie, was that during those early couple of months, a lot of the people in the church would come up to me as the new pastor, and maybe some of your listeners have experienced this, and they would say to me, John, why can't we just forgive him mm-hmm. and let him come back? Wow. Are we, do, do, we not, do we not forgive? Why, can't, why is he not the lead pastor? Why are you the lead pastor? And another really challenging thing as a lead pastor is to know the details of something. Yeah right? <laughs> the details of, of it all. And so the way I best illustrate it is this, this is really what makes great leaders in my opinion too. Can you carry around a loaded gun that you will never fire? Wow. So, so you just love them through that process. You don't say, well, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why he yeah. can't. You carry, you carry a loaded weapon that you never fire. That's, that's integrity, mm. you know? Um, so, so those are a couple of the ways that I, that I would say we do that. We, we tried to do that. Another thing you hinted at that I think is very helpful, and I think this is true of many, many stories that have broken a lot of hearts over the years and hurt a lot of people, but just because the leader had sometimes a moment that was out of character, sometimes yeah. it was a pattern. It was a serial pattern that went totally. over decades. Totally doesn't undo the good work that may have happened. It wasn't all rotten. I'm not talking about the leader there. I'm talking about the mission of the church. Like people genuinely were baptized, had life-changing experiences, uh, will never be the same again. And if you just pretend that time started when you assumed that and that all the sacrifices that happened before you and the life change that happened before you doesn't count, and that can happen without a moral failure too. It was like, you know, the last guy led the church from 400 to 150. You come in, you're the young hero. You turn it around, all of a sudden you're 600. And it's like, time started with you. And it's like, mm, yeah. this is a very selfish view of leadership. So I think there's a lot of wisdom here. Um, but because this is such a common situation, extremely common in the sense of a millennial leader taking over for a boomer or an older Gen X leader who stepped aside even under normal conditions, and there's broken things or declining things. But then also, unfortunately, moral failure is a storyline of, of the church in this current moment as well. Any other tips for the incoming leader? Uh, so, so I like to say... I, a lot of this has a lot of this again. When I was in it, I had no idea what I was doing, <laughs> yeah. and by the grace of God, I got through this. And so, in, I'm nine years away from it now. Nine years from what we call it. Yeah. <laughs> um, as I reflect back, I really do think I did four things that was pivotal, right, to to the survival of the church. And again, when I was doing these things, I don't know that I even realized that I was doing them. Yeah. But one. I, the very first thing I did was I built my team. Mm. I knew that now as an eight, I may have been patient on a lot of things, but one thing I was not patient on is I established my leadership team within a couple of weeks. Like I was the new coach coming in and I was going to have my own assistant coaches. And so I, I made some pretty big shifts really quickly internally, only on the leadership side. And that side. includes some of the family I, I, members moving them around? I didn't have oh, to you didn't do have that, to. luckily. Okay. Nope, I didn't Great. have to do that. Um, if somebody's in that situation, uh, oof. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. I don't know that call, I want to give advice on that. Call a mentor. Here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Call me offline yeah. or, or email me or something. Um, but I, I built my team. The second thing, and I, again, I don't, I don't think I realized I was doing this, but I think it's actually the most important thing I did. I built trust mm-hmm. first. I built trust before I made big decisions. And so... When I when I, I remember the very first weekend I took I took the stage to preach my very first sermon. Before I ever preached a sermon, I said, "Guys, I know that many of you don't know me, you don't trust me, you don't know if I'm capable of doing this." I said, "What I'm asking you to do is credit me trust." The Bible says in Genesis that God credited Abraham righteousness, which means he hadn't earned it. He gave him righteousness in advance, and I said, "What I'm asking you to do today on November the first, 2014." is credit me trust, and I'm going to try as hard as I can to pay that trust back to you over the course of the next 
decades that I'm here. And I really think the greatest thing any leader could ever do is just do what you say you're going to do. Um, and so I think building a team was key. Building trust was key. And then from then on, for about the next three years, I focused on building culture. I want to build one of the healthiest cultures internally and externally. So that was core values. That was reestablishing some things as a church, as, as our values. And then the one that I try to continue to work on is the fourth one. And that's I got to build myself. Mm. Like I, I have realized that I'm my biggest problem. In fact, I think I might be my organization's biggest problem. Like I'm the lid. And so I need to, I have to always work on me because if I can't take my church from a two to a four, it's because I was a four. And if I take my church from a four to a six, it's because I was a six. I, I grew to a six. And so I know I spatted those off real quick. It's because I've really reflected on that a lot. Those are the four things that I think was really critical. It's a great roadmap. What about, uh, what other things did you do to build trust? Um, I, a lot of it, a lot of it comes natural, naturally to me. I know there's a lot of pastors and leaders out there that don't, um, they're not, they're, they're introverts, right? I'm an extrovert. I, I love people. I want to be around as many people as I possibly can. So I, I just love to be with the people. I love to be with the staff. I love to be, you know, all staff and, you know, connected as much as I can. But I'm also, I'm, I'm also not as much of a green room guy. I like to be out in the lobbies and, and knowing people. And so a lot of it is, a lot of it, I don't know that I did it strategically, Carrie, as much as it is, I was just doing what I, what I love to do. I think the challenge for me, and you may be able to speak into this, I would love to hear your thoughts is if that's not your personality, right? If, if your personality isn't to be full on engaged with the people, um, I have, I have another really strategic thing I did, but I don't know what your thoughts are on that before I go to the yeah, second It's interesting because I played both sides of the fence. Pre-burnout, like pre-2006, I was very much extroverted, couldn't get enough of people. And I've never fully recovered. So I think I'm probably an ambivert with extrovert memory. And uh, what I find really helpful in this season is, as someone who recharges alone these days, is to say, this is part of the job. You're supposed to be there. You're supposed to smile, meet people, walk slowly through the room, connect with folks. And it is hard for me, particularly at, at my church and particularly as founding pastor when I don't really have a role, you know? Like, it's not like, don't tell me your stuff because it's not my stuff to deal with anymore. And yet everyone kind of sees me as this <laughs> public figure who knows who I am. So it's very difficult. And I remember this part of the job, this part of the job, this part of the job. So when I really want yep. to be alone, which is honestly quite often these days, mm -hmm. I'm just like, this is, this is your job, man. Go do it and do it well. And wow. that's not that's insincere, exactly right. but you know, in the same way that I don't get no. excited, I bet you don't get excited and, oh good, I have 17 emails I haven't responded to since this interview started. 100%. It's part of the job, man. Yeah. It's the cost of doing business. And so that's not business. Yeah. And people are our ministry. Like your preaching isn't your ministry, right? Like people are the ministry. And so if you're not going to spend time with people appropriately and selectively, then what are you doing in ministry? Yeah, there, there are days where I get done preaching and everything in me wants to run to the green room because I am here, exhausted. Here. Yeah. I am mentally, emotionally, spiritually, I am drained. And, I, and there are days that I force myself to go to the door and greet people as they leave. And, and you know, let's be honest, when a line of 17 people line up to, to meet with you and 15 of them want something from you, they need money, they need this, it's exhausting. It but I tell myself the same thing, Carrie. This is what I do. Yeah, like I chose to be a mm -hmm. pastor and not a preacher. I'm a I'm a pastor yeah. first, preacher second. Uh, the 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 one real strategic thing I did, and I hesitated to say it because I don't know that it's for everybody, but Please. I'll share you with you what I did. So, I knew I was very aware that trust had been yeah. lost. Right, uh, we all know the saying: trust is is gained by the spoonful and lost by the bucketful. And in our church, somebody had picked up the whole bucket and turned it upside down and Shattered. it was gone. Yeah. And I'm the new guy coming in and there is no trust. And so I was sitting one, one. so this was uh, spring of 2015, January 2015. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching the, the, the State of the Union address where the president gets up, right, and gives the State of the Union address. And although our presidents don't really do what I think they should, <laughs> should do, the intention, the the purpose of that is to say, this is where we're at. This is this is where we're at as a nation. This is our challenges. This is our what we've overcome. And I just thought to myself, 
I'm going to try that. So that spring I got up and I did, I did what we call the state of the church address. And I just, I went over crazy things that no pastor, very few pastors talk about. I tell the church how my salary is set. This is how my salary is set. We have an elder board. Um, I don't set my own salary. And I, 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 and sometimes I think people in the pew sit there and wonder how the pastor's mm. salary is set. And so I was like, well, I'm just going to tell them. I'm not going to tell them what my salary is, but I, I can tell them that the elders hire a, do a compensation study, and the compensation study gives it to a committee, an external committee. The committee gives a recommendation to the board, and the board sets my salary. And and I would say things like, um, last year we were, you know, two percent up in giving, and and. 4% up in expenses. And we ended in the red by $56,000. And here's our debt. This is what our debt is. And I still do that every year to this so day. So transparency. And t- transparency. Like, and it's so funny, Carrie, when you sit there and I don't go turning over rocks that no one's looking under. I'm not, you know, there, there you can all, you can obviously share way too much information and I don't, but I give, I would give broad strokes and you will never, uh, you know, when you're preaching, you can see everyone's facial expressions. People look at you like, oh my gosh, I can't believe a pastor is telling us how his salary is set. (laughs) So that was something that I did. And again, I don't know that that's a good fit for everybody, but for our church, it was necessary in those early years. Um, Talk about building culture. So you also Mm -hmm. change culture. This is coming up a lot because like I said, the vast majority of churches have to be revitalized or businesses or organizations. So how did you go about establishing a fresh culture, which seems to have gelled three to four years into your leadership. Yeah. So I I did this at the church and then I also did it at the university when I got there. Um, I think that if you, uh, I think if you want to change the culture of any organization, the only way to change the court culture is to change the way people talk. Um, So I think most people see culture as well. It's, it's the core values we put on the walls and we have a, you know, a guideline. We have staff values and a church value and we, we put them on the walls in the lobby and we put them on banners and, um, and all those things are great. But I became really intentional and dedicated to how do I make these sticky? Mm. There's a great book. You, you know, that d- book yep. made to stick. And how do we, how do we make these values so sticky? If you walk into most churches and say, Hey, what's the, vi- what's the vision here? or give me two of your eight core values or two of your six. Most people have no idea what, what those are. And many times it's because we haven't made them sticky enough, right? Um, so I know one of the core values we, we made at TKU is we have grit. We believe hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. And so there's just they just make them sticky. And then before you know it, people start changing the way they talk. And you hear people in the lobby reciting your core values in, in common day vernacular. And again, it takes time, but that's something that we really did with a lot of intentionality. And every time we get on stage to make an announcement, we're going we're, we're gonna, to, before we make an announcement, we're going to say, here at Victory Church, we steward God's resources and with radical generosity. And so because of that, blank. Ah, right? so you're actually uh, we, vision casting. I was, that was my next question. How do you make sure that yeah. people in the church understand your values? Because I know churches that have values that aren't even on their website and never get announced. Yeah, we say them. We, we just... Uh, we say them to where people are nauseous <laughs> from them. Like I one know. of our core values is we grow best. Yeah, we grow best in circles, right? We 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 kind of did away with all of our conferences re- recently because we just didn't feel like it was moving the needle. And we said, well, how do we get people out of rows and into circles? Because we believe that real life change happens face to face, not mm-hmm. in rows. And so before we talk, we we call our small groups circles. So we try to incorporate those values into our everyday vernacular. And I, it goes back to the simplicity. It sounds too simple, but I really do believe that if your organization is talking uh, your values, then they're talking your culture. And if they're talking your culture, they're behaving your culture. And if they're behaving your culture, you have a new culture. The culture has shifted. Um, and it takes time, right? It, you know, growing your hair out, you don't really know when it got long. It just got long one day. Um, but, it, but, but, it, but it got long. At, at some point. Um, so that that's one of the uh, more fundamental things I would say that I would focus on is not not creating core, core values. Change the way people talk in your organization through the values. 
you did a lot of things right, and there have been a lot of uh, good nuggets to glean so far. But I'm guessing, John, you probably made a misstep or two along the way. What what are what are one or two mistakes that you would say? Hey, leaders, I got the scars to show you on this one. You you don't have to do this. What what yeah. are one or two mistakes that you would ad- advise leaders not to make? If I could go back, Carrie, and talk to my one year in, two year in self, I would um, I would tell myself to be less fear based. Um, I I was. I led out of fear a vast majority of the time. And, and you know, the hedgehog principle, like whenever we were bleeding out, we just, we curled up in a ball to protect our vital organs financially. We had no vision. We had no, we were, we were changing culture, but we had no vision for the future. I, we were bleeding so bad that I couldn't even imagine having a vision for growth. The vision like, is stay alive tomorrow. And I think right? I really, yes. And I think I really limited us by, by leading that way. And what I re- actually, I'm actually realizing that now, Carrie, in the last year or two, what I've realized is those early years were formative in my leadership style. And what I'm, what I'm beginning to see now is that it actually made a hesitant leader out of me to where I'm leading more, more from a fear of surviving than I am from thriving. And I really felt like the Lord kind of put that on my heart last year. And I, I just really sensed the Lord saying to me, John, you're not in survival mode anymore, but you're still behaving as though you're in survival mode. You're still leading like you're in survival mode. Um, and so I really wish I could go back and really change. In a lot of ways, a lot of that saved us, right? I mean, those early years, we needed to live that way. But how do I make that shift? How could I go back and make that shift sooner to where I didn't waste nine years? Not I say waste, mm. that's a terrible word for it. Mm-hmm. But you know what I mean, you know. Could I have could I have turned the ship quicker if I would have been a little more faith based and a little less fear based? So, not a pithy question, um, a serious one. But where did that fear come yeah. from? Was that natural? Are you sort of that way internally, or was yeah, that just totally. oh my gosh, this is a train wreck? Like what what happened? Has that been like a lifelong thing, or more of a situational yeah. thing for you? I th- I think so, Carrie. I was so I I uh, grew up. We weren't in poverty, but I, I grew up uh, lower middle class. I would say my dad was a pastor. My dad always pastored very small churches. My dad's a hero of mine. Like I think, and I think this is cool for some of your listeners to hear. Some of my biggest heroes are pastors of yeah. a church of a hundred, yeah. one hundred and fifty, because I lived that right where where me and my brother mowed the yard, my mom and my sister yeah. cleaned the toilets. My mom was the worship leader and my dad preached. And so you talk about a grind. And so I think that became ingrained into me that, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in some circles, we would call it a poverty mentality, whatever. I, I think that there's remnants of that there, both from the, my experience in the church, but also in my experience from uh, growing up in a lower middle class family, so imagine, imagine it would be an interesting mm. case study. Carrie, you take two pastors um, that that grew up in pastors' homes. One of them was Craig Rochelle's son, and one of them pastored a church of a hundred, and that's their son. How, how much more faith? Like I know all of Craig's kids, and and they have yeah. crazy yeah. faith. They have amazing faith, right? Because of the environment in which they grew up in, and and I such a great question that you asked me and it's even making me reflect a little bit, but that's probably a pretty important question for leaders to ask themselves. What made you lead the way you lead both good and bad? And if I was guessing, I would say that that is something that the Lord is really trying to work out of my heart. Um, that you are not that anymore. You know, it's like Gideon, who are you Gideon? Well, I'm the least, you know, and no, you're a mighty warrior. Stop behaving like that and do this, uh, be who I've called you to be, not what your past tells you that you are. So. Yeah, that, you know, it's interesting. I hadn't really thought about that. I was having this discussion recently with a friend and like, you know, they said, you're so entrepreneurial and you're always looking at the upside. And I'm probably most days, not every day, most days, glass half full. But my parents were immigrants. Like think about my grandparents and parents were immigrants. Wow. To, I was born in Canada, but they weren't. Uh, that takes a lot of faith. My Both my parents ran a business together for 25 years. It was in manufacturing, like tool and mold. 
but I watch them create something out of nothing. And I'm like, oh, you know, and that's just normal. You're 15, your parents launch a business. I was like, yeah, whatever, whatever. Of course, you know, now as adults, <laughs> they're retired. You find out it was really a roller coaster for them and the it whole deal grind. and a grind. And uh, they made it by the skin of their teeth and did very well. But, you know, for me, that was probably extremely formative because I'm like, oh yeah, well, you, you can just do this. Like I've, I've seen it happen before. And that kind of dumb naivete has probably served me well and also gotten my toe stub more than once. But yeah, that's really mm-hmm. interesting. Um, yep. But growing up in a very different environment would be would be super challenging. So, huh, fascinating. Yeah, and I, I think another one for me that I would go back and tell myself, yeah. and you know, you're bringing up the Instagram is make this makes this one really interesting because as an eight, I shouldn't be this, but I am. And I've, I've taken the Enneagram twice, and at both yeah. times I was an eight. But I, maybe <laughs> I'll take it again. But I tell you, in my early years, and it was probably because of the situation we were in, but I, man, I was mm. a people pleaser. I, I was a people pleaser, Kerry. And a lot of it was because, a lot of it was math to me. There's a, there's a spiritual side to church. There's a business side to church. <sighs> and we were bleeding out. And people equated to tithe and tithe equated to finances and finances equated yeah. to survival. And so there, there's waves, right? And everybody that's ever been a re-leader and taken over a church, you totally, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When it's announced, you have the biggest attendance mm. in church history. The biggest, like the day that there's an announcement made and maybe for about the next three or four weeks, you have some of the biggest attendance you've ever had in your whole life. Because people love to go to the NASCAR uh-huh. to watch the car wreck. Car's car still wrecks. on fire. Everybody right? wants to see it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And two or three weeks in, you're like, wow, we're having amazing attendance. Well, this is great. God's up to something. No, people are just coming yeah. to watch the car crash. So then there's this mass exodus, right? But then over the course of the next 12 to 18 months, there's trickle. There's there People are just trickling out little by little by little, here and there, here and there. And some people that you never thought would leave, leave. And some people that you um, never thought would leave actually right. stay. Or you, you did think they would leave, they actually stay. Um, and so what it created in me, Carrie, is any, I began to chase down anybody that I thought might leave. And if anybody wanted to have lunch with me, I had lunch with them. And if anybody wanted to have coffee with me, wow. I had coffee with them. And I, I, was, I, felt, I felt like I was back in sales trying to sell myself and sell the church. And I really wish I wouldn't mm. have led that way. If people are going to leave, just let them leave. Um, so, so those are a couple of, of uh, right off the top of my head, regrets that I would say that I have in my leadership style. Yeah. Uh, so much to drill down on this conversation. I get that question a lot. Like, do we, do we focus on growth or do we try to, you know, plug the holes in the boat before it goes down. What is, in your view, the challenge with chasing down people who are leaving going, please don't go, please don't go, please don't go. What, why, why is that not an effective okay. approach to leadership, discipleship, et cetera? Can I tell a story that, that um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna totally. to make it G-rated, but it's going to be kind of, it's, it's gross, but I'm going to make it not gross, okay, with the words that I choose. Right. Um, so... Jimmy Evans is another guy that's in my life. Um, he calls me one day and I'm telling him these stories about these, e- I'm replying to every email, you know, I'm telling them, I'm telling my staff, if we get any bad emails, just send them to me and I'm going to reply to them. And he said, mm-hmm. um, he said, John, he said that, you know, uh, your, your church is a living organism in a sense, right? It's, it's a breathing, living thing. And he said, uh, let me ask you a question, John. Uh, when you eat something in your body, in your physical body, your body will absorb the nutrients that it needs out of that uh, out of that food, and then it will dispose of what the body doesn't need. So you know where I'm going. I'm trying to paint this very very uh, analogy. Nicely. Analogy understood. <laughs> analogy. Said, Have understood. you ever picked up what your body excreted and re ate it? And I was just like, <laughs> what are you talking about? You're, he goes, John, oh he gosh. said, these aren't bad people. And, I'm, I, and he said, I am not calling people that. I'm, that is not what I'm saying. He said, but yeah, <laughs> Good but, but your church is a living organism. And there are people that are coming 
that will be there for a long time and some that are passing through, so to speak. And he said, what you're yeah. doing is the equivalent. God is moving them out or they're moving them out. Them, they're moving out themselves. And he said, stop yeah. picking it up and re-eating it. And when you're chasing down, if, if you're wow. chasing down people over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, all you're doing is try to determine who you pastor. And you don't get to determine that, John. You don't get to decide who you're pastoring. Mm-hmm. You just pastor who comes. Mm-hmm. And so as crass as that is, that really helped me, Carrie, to say, you know what, as much as I don't want them to leave and as much as I wish they wouldn't, maybe it's their time. And um, maybe they're supposed to go provide nutrition to another body. They're, both, they're supposed to go be nutritious mm-hmm. somewhere else. Um, so I know that's not the greatest story, but. That's quite the analogy. <laughs> Question for you. Did, did any of them end up coming back? Yep. I mean, I, I do a little bit of coaching with my successor and I'm like, play the long game, play the long game. I've been here 28 yep. years. People leave, not everybody leaves, but some people leave. And it's amazing how many people come back. And Tons. I'm like, man, we can't burn the yep. bridge. Like, yeah, so you found Tons. that too. A lot of them Tons. came back. Tons. Tons. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. What are you learning about the people who return if you play the long um, game? I think there are... I think in leadership and even in that in that context, it's like God brings perennials your way and He brings annuals your way. And in, in a mm-hmm. in a an annual, you have to replant every year. It's a plant that you put in your flower beds that it's going to die at the end of every season, and you're going to have to replant it the following year. And then there's uh, perennials that come back every year. They're with you all the time. And and there's some people that come and go, and they're just kind of like that. And then there's perennials that are like, come hell or high water. We can have a 12 below freezing winter. I'm coming back in the spring. And in the winter, their roots were actually growing deep, um, even when you couldn't see them. Those are the type of people that I want to, I don't know if promotes the word, but I want perennials, man. I want people, and not that annuals are bad. They're still pretty when they come and it's great. And you're welcome here. We'd love to plant you for whatever season you stay. But man, I want to, try to really decipher who are my perennials um, and who are my annuals. And we love both. And both of you can plant yourselves Mm. here and be pretty. Um, So that's one thing I'm learning. You love them, right? Whether they come or go. And that's one thing I I think I learned from my dad. My dad was so good at that as a pastor. Um, Mm. Like, again, small church pastors are, let's be honest, they're they're real pastors, Gary. They're, they're real pastors. Yeah. They pastor yeah. a flock, you know? So, yeah. 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 You know, so another tough question, you can reject it and we can move on. But, you know, I had a mentor of mine because it's like, okay, somebody left, they were kind of angry, they caused a problem, then they came back. I'm, I'm never one, unless they're like toxic that they can't mm-hmm. come. They're creating all kinds of damage. But if they just come back and they're like, oh yeah, we're back, you know, and that kind of thing. Question is, do you appoint them to leadership? And a mentor of mine once told me, I asked him that question. I don't want to name names, (laughs) but he just said, nope, you left, you can't. (laughs) Like, okay, all right. Like that's so clear as day. Was there any ambiguity in that answer? And I I think for the most part, I followed that rule. Like, I'm not saying you can't serve or be on the parking team or greet, but like elder level or maybe worship leader level, you know, that sort of inner core of volunteers that I'm less certain about. And I can't think of an instance where someone seriously left, caused some division, came back where I'm like, yeah, we're going to put you in leadership. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think you and I would both agree there. There's so many variables to that, right? But I think... It depends yeah, on yeah. the the context of how they left and why they left, and um, uh, and you hit it. I was you said what I was about to say. What level of leadership are we talking about? You know, are they are they greeting? Are they right. elder? I would say, man, I I am so so guarded on eldership. Um, yeah, personally, got to be careful um, with that. So I I would say that you and I would line up perfectly there. I I I I, I certainly wouldn't want to do it because I'm holding a grudge. Or I have some residue right. of bitterness, or like Hebrew says, I let some bitter root grow up. So I'd want to try to guard mm-hmm. my heart and make sure that it was pure. But um, fool me once, you know, <laughs> shame on you. Sh- fool me twice, yeah, shame on yeah. me. Um, so I'd be really careful in that instance for certain. Yeah, yeah, and I'm not saying never. I'm just saying I haven't, can't think of an example where that was true. Yeah. Um, but yeah, okay. Wow, this has been rich. Any other advice for people who are Re-leading, leading something 
trying to fix what's broken, uh, something they didn't start. What, what I would what say have we surround yourself on? with other re-leaders. And a lot of the people that I've talked yeah. to are like, yes, yeah, someone has finally put a term on something that that I can relate with. Because mm-hmm. for me, I would, I would read tons of leadership books and they were all great and they're full of tons of wisdom. But most leadership books are written in the context of grow, build fast. Let's do this, grind, mm-hmm. push, grow fast. And, and blank yes, slate, yes. right? That blank slate. And idea. re-leading is yeah. such a unique animal that there's so many variables. And I, uh, not that we would ever copy and paste leadership books anyways, but if you ever try to copy something and paste it into a re-leader situation. So I would say really try to find a community, try to find friends, uh, other leaders that are that are yeah. in your shoes. That's what really helped me survive is I, I was with other people like Brady Boyd who had walked a mile in my shoes. They were 10 steps ahead of me. And they could turn around and say, watch that step right there. There's a mine right there. Don't step right there. <laughs> so I, I would say that's so critical in that journey um, of any re-leader. Hmm. Well, speaking of re-leading, that's uh, your book, yeah. right? You get a brand new book okay. out called Re-Leader. Tell us about the book and whether you have any special offers with it or where people can yeah, find so it. so I do some writing on a, on a website. I love to write. And that's one thing I've discovered uh, since leaving the university yeah. is I... I love to write. And so I've, I've been doing just some weekly writing um, and it's called Releader and it's for Releaders. I got a podcast <laughs> called Releader, but the book really is a, is a, a, a writing out of what I discovered about myself, that I'm a Releader and <laughs> what I do is I fix broke stuff. And so the book is titled Releader, <laughs> How to Fix What You Didn't Break. Um, there's probably a later book that needs to be written about Releader, How to Fix What I Did Break. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Doesn't Rick Warren say that happens after year five? Yes. It's like, oh, now, now it's, it's my, my stuff, stuff that I'm fixing. And there's a whole nother realm, Carrie, of imagine somebody who has to follow a good leader. That's a re-leader, but mm. that, that might be even harder than... Yeah, you're right. That's another harder. subset because this guy walked on water, a woman walked on oh, water, oh, yeah. and you know everybody adores them. So yeah, They're so not yeah the book anymore. is this yeah. parallel. Um, it's, it's written for all leaders in re-leadership not just pastors, um, but I do parallel uh, in some ways a, a picture of them rebuilding the temple. And really there's this beautiful story mm-hmm. of how they rebuilt the temple that's this in sync mm-hmm. with what it takes to relead an organization. And so that's the book. And uh, you can find the podcast, you can find the writings, you can find the book, all at uh, just a website called releader.co. Re- releader.co. Gotcha. John, super helpful. You on Instagram these days? I am, man. On just, the just John Chastine, no H in John, just J-O-N-C-H-A-S-T-E-E-N. And, and uh, really, Instagram's about all I do. I can't tolerate the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I find myself most times these days, too. Yeah. John, this has been a very, very rich time together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie. It's been an honor. <laughs>